like that. And I don't know, she probably got a couple hundred dollars something out of it like that. But then you had to pay, I guess they charged 25%, so about all you had left was a piece of the rind. My Uncle Jake was spelling I, we fared pretty good. We had a cider mill, and we got an award. They had, had a hearing in Kingston. I was 22 at the time, and Uncle Jake was about 60. And we didn't have very much books, but anyway, I don't know, maybe we kind of got it under the skin a little bit. The old man, the young boy, and we got an award of $1,050. And we had to pay 25% that uh, this Brown and Slauson to represent it in those indirect proceedings. And I know we went to New York in the fall of 1912 <laughs> and got our money after the 25 percent was deducted. So we got a little gravy out of the cider mill business anyway. Do you think people were fairly uh, treated by the city financially? Well, I would say on an average they got fair, fairly good prices, but some got better prices than others. The, the area was divided up into into uh, sections and uh, well, over which uh, uh, commissions were appointed for appraisal and some commissions were more liberal than others. Mm -hmm. Now in our own case where my, our farm was, we had a much better farm than Uncle Jake Respell who had joined us, but he got a within a thousand or so a better war than we did. Mm -hmm. But that was very largely up to the commission and up toward Boysville, to the upper end, they, they fared better than the, the, than, the, than the general property owners otherwise, for some reason. Um, what about A.T. Clearwater? Uh, he's a, a colorful figure that appears in the story of the reservoir. Do you, do very, you color, very colorful figure. And he conducted the, the instigations when this flooded war start, uh, first started, they had a m good many court hearings and, and suits there in Kingston but to try and prevent New York City from getting permission to, to take this as a reservoir property. He fought it. He fought it yeah. for the people. Yeah. And I don't know, I guess he more or less did it on his, on his own hooks. Hmm. Well, yeah, I know that he was the lawyer also for the railroad. For the oh yes, he was a railroad lawyer. Yeah, yeah. also. What other thing I wanted to ask you too is about uh, uh, camp life. You, you, uh, supposing you got thirsty, and and you wanted a little drink. What, what did you do? I, well, they didn't sell it on the we, on the property, did they? Well, you might just go to your next door neighbor, and, <laughs> and you'd find most anything you wanted. According to Martin Eckert, in the, in the Reservoir Aqueduct building days, between the town line up in the up the Kaika, down to Stone Ridge, there was either 12 or 13 places where you could always buy a drink. <laughs> well, if you want a little of that stuff what the scats fight over, fights over, you get that too. <laughs> there were a couple of those places. Yeah, there were a couple of those. A couple of those places. Yeah. You don't know anything about them, though, I suppose. Well, not too much, largely hearsay, but I was a drummer in a few of those battles. <laughs> what about uh, cultural activities? I, I hear they had a singing group or something. Is that true, down the camp? Well, now that, personally, I don't know too much about. Only about the, the engineers. They would have their big uh, dinners in Kingston, and then these songs they wrote up just like I was a warbling it now, to songs of the uh, tunes of, of the day. And then they'd get go down there and have their dinners to the, well, in those days, it was uh, the Stuyvesant Hotel, principally, where they went. And, of course, all these songs were sung. Could you sing us one more, maybe? Well, I might try. Seems like a good time to what would you? What one would you like to hear, Bob? Well, there's one near near the front that you used to sing, um, and I, I don't I don't remember which one it is, but I remember you always go pretty much to the front of the break. Wait till the dam is finished. I think that may be it. Yeah. All right. That's the, has Carlton in it or something. Carlton. Either. Now this is, would be a story of the of the building of the Ashokan Dam. <clears throat> uh, Carlton E. Davis was a division engineer. Engineer, 
and he was the first one that I knew of to come up here, and this pretty well tells, tells a story. On an autumn day, it's wait, it's wait till the sunshine, Nellie's a tune. On an autumn day, Carlton went away with his map case by his side. Through each mountain lane, he tramped for fame. We must do the job, he cried. At the town goer's site, there's a snag or two and a dollar bridge a few. So a plan he made, and at it he stayed, and we heard him softly say, Wait till the dam is finished and the water's rising high. We will be happy, Waldo, don't you sigh. Down at the duck we'll wander, Robert, you and I, wait till the dam is finished. Bye and bye. We must have, said he, some topography and some holes we must put down. Then on high point old, place a signal bowl to triangulate the town. Then by so by day and night, when the stars shone bright, the work was done without relief. And he whispered low, boys, keep on the go, and report in to the chief. Wait till the dam is finished and the water's rising high. We will be happy, Waldo, you and I. Down the aqueduct we'll wander, Waldo, you and I. Wait till the dam is finished. Bye and by. So the boys obeyed, and the plans were made, and the contract soon was let. Muckers, small and big, started in to dig, and they hustled some, you bet. Before many days, the big cable waves dropped the concrete down below, and hour by hour, from the very start, you could see the big dam grow. Wait till the dam is finished and the water's rising high. We will be happy, Waldo, don't you cry. Down aqueduct we'll wander, Waldo, you and I, wait till the dam is finished, bye and bye. Here's number four. Now the coping's on and the wings are done, soon the lake will start to fill. And that near before shallow waters pour and rejoice New Yorkers will. So the big dam stand, famed as money land, as the pride of Asho can. And J. Waldo Smith will be known forthwith as the Catskill Water Man. <laughs> <laughs> who was J. Waldo Smith? Well, he was a he was a chief chief en engineer hired by the city of New York to go ahead and plan this project. He was really in charge of everything. He was really, he was a, the man with the brass nuts, in other words. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see him much around the job, or was he well, in New York? I never recall much of seeing J. Waldo Smith, but often Carl E. Davis. Yeah. Another thing in that song, uh, it, it talks about the water rising. Um, do you remember when they closed the dam? I it surely was like do. How the valley filled? <clears throat> well, I'll say this. When it was finished, the first water turned through the aqueduct to New York was on the 29th of December, 1915. And one of the old gate tenders, one of the, one of the first men to employed local men to employed by New York City, Oscar Dudley. He was the one who turned the valves on down at the gatehouse to let the first water go through the aqueduct. A local man. Local man. He had the honor of that. Well, when was the dam closed? The dam, the dam was closed <coughs> in the, well, we got to get back a little bit. When the dam was when the dam was being built, we had floods in those days, like they still do now. And in the spring of 1910, the there was a covered bridge that stood above the dam, about half a mile, known as the Bishop's Falls Covered Bridge. And the water backed up enough so it floated that from its foundation 
and, and, and drifted down against the dam, where it laid a month or so till the, till the water went down and the debris and everything could be cleaned out of the, out of the pipes under the dam to remove the bridge by the, by the, by the cable wave. That would pretty well answer that. And then in November 1913, we had another very, very severe flood. And at that time, the water backed up, way up to what overflowed the Shokan Bridge, which directly crossed from West Shokan to Shokan. And incidentally, the bridge was said to have been the lo longest wagon bridge in the state. It was over 500 and and 500 feet long, and it had eight stone piers. It was on the foundation of a prede predecessor. And I remember watching it from here. As the water came up, you just see, could see the top of the bridge. And then the water, when it settled down a little bit, the midsection of the bridge toppled right over downstream. And it was said that the planks on the bridge had been, plank had been fastened down with braces onto the outside tiers of the bridge, and it was said, as it turned out to be, which was probably was so, that New York City, when, when the opportunity came and this flood came, they wanted to stop traffic going across from the two villages. And so that, that stopped it when the bridge toppled over, and the next year, the contractor for Nishi, Jack Elvey, he, he removed the, all those, that stick steam steel bridge and piled it up on the other side of the reservoir, and eventually it was sold. I, I don't know, I couldn't say what, what he did with it. The the, uh, the water came up rapidly then? I mean, well, it kept it? rising and rising and rising till you, you see it flooding the whole lower part of the valley, and you kind of commence to wonder what it was really going to look like. But that's the size it got at that time. And then the next year, 1914, that's when I was operating a steam ro roller, and of course the, the water all went down under the dam at that time. Mm -hmm. And there was a long a ch a channel they called the, the, the West, West Channel. And of course it's still there yet. And as the water got up to that, it was filtered out through down, down where the, uh, the aerators are at the present time. And they went that went they went through the waters then went through the railroad tunnel at, at that time and flooded everything. They didn't expect they, it to. They worked day and night with pumps and everything to try <laughs> and, and bail the gatehouse out. This would be under control. That was after the dam was closed. It still went through the. That dike. was after that when the, when the dam got closed in that flood of, of 1913 when it flowed over the the Shokan Bridge. <laughs> How long do you think it took to? Uh, get the amount of water that it has today. It's present. What's that? How long do you think it took to get the amount of water that it has today, more or less its well, capacity? Well, it was first flooded. It took, it took about a year to fill up the reservoir, as I recall it. But when they first talked, talked about it, when the surveying was going on and all that, the surveyors would say where the Shokan station was, there'd be 20 feet of water. Old farmers were saying, hey, God, they have to send a Sears Rogue buck and get some water to fill it up as high as that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard people thought there was a leak or something in, in the in the Well, now, that true? The, the leak, there was a leak developed over on the on the West Hurley Dyke, under the, under the dike there, and they worked for a long time after it was filled up, and they had to draw the water out the East Basin to do that. And they put in carloads after carloads of cement where they drilled, drilled, down, drilled down in the core wall of the dam mm -hmm. to stop that leak. It may leak some yet, that I couldn't say. Was that Winston and Company that had the Winston contract Company, for that? Winston Company, that's right. Yeah, I see. So they were required as first with MacArthur Brothers Company. Yeah, and right. then Winston Company took, took it over. During the construction? Yeah. I see. Hmm. The West Hurley Dyke was one of the last things to be built, I that, That's right. That's right. You also said before that you took force account. Uh, what, yes, what I, I took force account. Well, that was a sort of a time timekeeper's job there. I I worked after the summer after I'd worked for the city, and I got malaria down there in that old swamp, and that kind of put a crimp in my sails a little bit. So they so they gave me a better job for a while. Well, I had to go, my duties was to go around and certify, as they called it at that time, 
when the different gangs would go to work. Some would, like up in Yale Court, would go to work at six, uh, six o'clock in the morning. And one morning, I'd get up there with my bicycle and certify that so many men in different gangs went to work at that time. And maybe the next day, I'd go be sent to what was known as, as the sand pit to see how many men were working there. And another time, I'd, I'd be sent to, to where the, the they, they,